Okay, so it's the first uh, session. Uh, welcome, everybody. <laughs> There's such a, such a big number this today. Uh, of the All of Us Seminar, it's an annual seminar. And this year, the All of Us Seminar is without a, without a, a team. Without a team, the direct we, we have only the All of Us <laughs> Seminar. It's, a, it's ontological framework of science. Yeah. And usually we have a very narrow team, but this year, no, to open like the first time you, we open it. And there will be many, uh, all the All of Us Seminar, I hope, will be around Belgium, so already we're scheduled to go to Leuven, we're scheduled to go to Liège, Hope, hopefully soon Namur will say yes, and we will have a, a, a wandering seminar around Belgium. And of course, part of your traveling will be paid by the FNS for that, but it's not that expensive. So traditionally, the All of Us seminar, I'm saying that to to you, in fact, are about uh, ontology and science, but without any dogmatism. So we're not realist necessarily or anti-realist. It's just when you pay attention to ontological commitment in, in the language, in, especially in the theory and the representation, that's part of the uh, All of Us seminar. You can be realist, you can be idealist, we don't care. Usually we try to avoid realism, and we try to have a discussion more about the kind of commitment inside the, the, the practice, the tradition, in theory, in the way people speak. So it's why there's the part about language. <coughs> it's uh, ontological with onto, with separated from the logical, and so we have a very nice, bizarre French way to, to cut the words. Because it's more about language than about, you know, does electron exist? I don't care much. Nobody. But do you commit to electrons when you build such, such, such a so today it will be exactly in that tradition. And like I said before, it's again one of my bizarre ideas. So I have an idea that something has not been made. I think I look for literature, I find nothing. And I say, but it's a great subject, it must be done. I must do it. And I discover why people do not, did not do it, because it's so complicated. So, Today I will present more project, not a paper, possibilities, ways to go somewhere, and after that uh, Kevin will come up to start the discussion. And uh, I will try to give you the flavor and be as less technical as possible, because it's quite a technical subject, but I'll try. So don't hesitate, we're a small number, you can cut me and ask questions if something is really obscure. And it will be. Okay. So, just to introduce the subject. So, when we think about modality in physics in particular, all the debates, and I say all the debates, are about laws, disposition. They are about the part of modality that is necessities. What are the natural necessities? What should we commit as natural necessity? What could they be? And they are never, and I say, Never about possibilities. Ever. You would think it's very strange. There's nothing published on natural possibilities in physics except to discuss probabilities. That's all. And you would think, you know, if you have necessity, necessarily you discuss the dual concept? No. So when you discuss about natural possibilities, we have to turn to metaphysical metaphysics literature. And it's very interesting the way metaphysics, most of metaphysics literature, describe possibilities, natural possibilities. Here I put a very um, typical quote of Williamson, and I will, I will read it because this, it shows exactly how metaphysicians understand natural possibilities, and it's quite weird for me, but, but understandable. In the metaphysical literature, like I said, physical possibility is usually understood as nomological possibility. So already they, they push towards the necessity again. And this is the quote. Typical definition of nominically possible okay, is a proposition is nominically possible, so it's a possibility, a natural possibility, if and only if it is metaphysically compossible with what in those circumstances are the laws of nature. 
their congestion is metaphysically possible. So for the metaphysician, a natural possibility is a metaphysical possibility that is selected by laws. So all the work about possibilities is done when you define metaphysical possibilities, but not when you never directly treat natural possibilities, you treat natural laws. And you see the natural laws select in the metaphysical possibilities. And if you look in the literature about metaphysical possibilities, there's nothing about nature. It's always, it's a kind of objective possibility that you contrast with epistemological possibilities or normative possibilities. So the debate is about the difference between metaphysics and something else, but it's not about na nature. So I, I was dissatisfied, interested. It's very elegant. It's a very nice definition. I think it's very clean. It's very clear. But it does not help me to understand natural possibilities without passing by laws. Okay? So my plan was let, let's, let's try a bottom-up approach. Let's try to look in physics directly where scientists talk about possible possibilities. And that, that's, that's the plan, and that's the plan that I will explain. I'm in a difficult position to, to achieve the plan. So when you look directly at how possibilities are used in the physical discourse, you automatically see two big families. There's the experimental possibilities, empirical possibilities, and theoretical possibilities in the discourse. I'm always talking about the discourse. So, experimental possibilities is systems and their behavior, because in physics it's always systems and their behaviors, that's the basic ontology of physics, that could be empirically produced, and the debate should be about the difference between can and could, should it be defined in principle, if you had the technology, or should it be defined with the technology you can really use, and there's an interesting debate. A big part of the dissertation of my student, Quentin Bruin, is about that, and it's very good, and this book will be available, or if not already given, very soon. And there's very nice things to say about what is an empirical possibility. And the other possibility that I will, that the other kind that I will discuss today is theoretical possibilities, so systems and behaviors that could be represented, that are at work, in our best theoretical frameworks. So today I will concentrate on this one, but of course a bottom-up project should include this one too. And the question of the relation should be discussed, but I won't do that today. So when you look for possibilities, discourse of possibilities, you have to look in, in certain formalism where you have to discuss, okay, I vary the situation, we could have done something else, etc. That's the way we go in the theory to see what is about the theoretical possibilities. But first, there's the problem of what is a system. And you would think that after hundreds of years of using this word, it would be clear. Absolutely not. Here I put four defendable definition, and there's other one about what is a physical system, and of course a biological system, it's even worse because the individuality of biology is more complicated than physics. So, first definition, a system is a collection of entities. Here I use the word entities in a very loose way, so it's the, for me it's the more general, you know, it's more general than object, individuals, etc. So a system is a collection of identities forming a whole, in a certain sense. A system is a connected portion of space-time and everything in it. Or a system is an entity for which we know what happens on the frontiers, whatever you mean by frontiers, spatial or not. You know, the, the system of a quantum system, the frontier will not be defined by space-time. Or, and that's that's the the Aristotelian strategy. It's the subject of dynamics, so if anything that has a dynamic is a system. 
So in this talk, really, I, I, don't, I don't want to enter in a discussion about system because it would be another paper. But in this talk, I will, for practical reason, use the, the intersection between these two definitions. So the system, we know what happened on the frontiers, and a system that is subject to dynamics. So I will really concentrate when physics talk about behaviors, about, about change, talk about stuff happening, and not when physics talks about structure, crystals, things like that, won't be discussed here. Okay? So for me, for the rest of the talk system is the interse intersection of these two definitions, whatever it is. Okay. If we look to classical physics, so for those of you that do not know what classical physics is, it's when it's not quantum. Every part of physics that is not quantum is called classical. Quite strange. If you go to, to classical physics and you look when scientists, when physicists invoke explicitly possibilities, there's, there's a main place to see that, it's in when they invoke a variational principle. So they try to get to an equation by varying certain conditions. So mathematically, variation principles are at the center of physics, they are extremely important. There's many ways to use them, there's many of them, and there is the clearer use, it's not the only use of possibilities, but there's a clear um, quantifier on possibilities when they say, I, I vary blah 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 and the good solution will be blah blah blah, etc. But problem, they don't seem to be coherent, at least in the way they use that, it's pretty free. In certain cases, the system you're trying to, to describe keeps its identity and you vary the, the, the possibilities, the dynamics, you vary the dynamics. Of course, uh, Aristotelian people will say this, this is wrong. <laughs> A system cannot keep its identity if you vary the dynamics. But it's what they do, at least in the formalism. And there's some formalism that correspond to this strategy. But you can also, and this definition I took in, in Butterfield, I will quote it, quote him in the next slides. You conserve the identity of the system and the dynamics, but you do you, you play with the frontiers or everything that is contingent. So you vary the contingent, you keep the identity of the system in the dynamics. Or you keep the dynamics, but you vary systems. And this is some generalization of the Lagrangian formalism, and the Hamiltonian formalism is what you do. So there's a lot of ways to get to, to the dynamics, to the physics, to use variational principle. There's no general theory of variational principles in physics. There's some relation between them, if they are empirically coherent or not, but it's, it's, a, it's an art. It's techniques that were developed a long, for a long time. In this talk, I will only focus on one of them, the Lagrangian formalism standard use, so you keep the identity of the systems and you vary the dynamics. Okay? Because it's a short talk. And because I have good reason to believe that the Lagrangian formalism is central to physics more than the other. Why? Two reasons that only interest the philosopher of physics, but I'll try to explain it to you. There's a problem in physics called the problem of time. So time does not behave well in many formalization of physics. So it's called the problem of time. So sometimes, for example, general relativity, you, can, you could show that time, there's a strong reason that there's a, there's a, the time is not a real variable, it's a gauge variable, so, you, so it's arbitrary, so it looks like conventional, it's not conventional, and it's for certain, because if you believe time exists. So there's some pathology in many, form, many theory, physical theory, related to time. But Lagrangian is extremely robust the Lagrangian formula to the problem of time. It's the more robust. So if we, we think, and most theoretical physicists that I know believe that we will have to get beyond the problem of time to get to the quantum gravity, the next big theory, we'll, the problem of time is a real problem, it's not just an artifact. It's good to use a formalism that is robust, that is not affected by the problem of time. 
For example, the Hamiltonian formalism, which is a very popular formalism for mechanics and for, for classical physics, is you have to twist it to add constraint to do something quite complicated to make it survive to the problem of time, to be able to do some, some physics. Second good advantage of the Lagrangian formalism, it's one of the formalism, not the only one, but it's one of the formalism where the, the passage from classical to quantum physics inside the, using the formalism is elegant, it's direct, it's a nice transition, so it's under control mathematically compared to other formalism. So it's a formalism that is robust for the main problem today of the problem of time in theoretical physics, and it's a formalism that could be used in a certain way for classical and quantum, so you can compare, you can discuss transition from one to the other. So it's a very nice formalism. That's the main thing you should keep in your mind. It's a nice formalism. And I have to say, I'm not sure I should say that recorded, that most paper in philosophy of physics stop there. So, so it's, uh, I describe my new formalism. I really like my formalism. I don't solve any philosophical problem because I don't care. But look at my formalism. It's better than yours, or it's nicer. So that's typical philosophy of physics. I'm just saying that for philosophers of biology that are real philosophers in the room. Oh, man, that, that's a long line. It will be bad. OK, let's discuss that now. A little bit of the idea of possibilities in the Lagrangian mechanics, because I presume that you don't you accept Kevin or your, oh, and, and Mathieu. You're not familiar with it. So the basic unit of possibilities in the Lagrangian mechanics is called kinematic possibilities. It's an history. What is an history? It's something like that. It starts somewhere, it finishes somewhere. It's an history. It's not necessarily a trajectory. It could be anything. Time is inside, so it's not even clear that it's a passage. It's not a necessarily a history like a passage of, of state through time. No, it's, it's, it's a block. You know, think Aristotle thinking history. It's a, it's a thing. Okay? And that's what a kinetic, kin kinematical possibility, the set of possible histories of a system, make the set of possibilities. Of course, now I, I, I did not define it, and, I, and it's almost never defined in physics. It's presumed that it exists. I will, in the next slide, discuss a little bit what these kinematic, the kinematical possibilities could be, okay? Just, they exist. I have a set of possible histories of the system. The dynamical possibilities are a subset of this set, and they are the set of possibilities that could actually happen, according to laws, to, what, to the necessities. So you have kinematical possibilities, dynamical possibilities, or are a subset of the kinematical possibilities. And I have to say that the distinction yeah, of, between kinematics, description of movement, dynamics, you know, why the movement happened, is a very canonical distinction in physics. Certain would say since Galileo, there's description of movement compared to description, description of why the movement happens. And if you look even uh, in uh, you know, uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, uh, 1911, you see clearly in the Boltzmann article about physical science, physics is divided between kinematics and dynamics, and among dynamics, there blah, 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 blah. So it's, it's strange, but you know, it's our discipline is right. OK. Now, what are these kinematical possibilities that are really explicitly defined? Oh, no. Next slide. First. If a history is not a succession of state, it's a block, how could we define change in Lagrangian mechanics? Because we don't have change. We have total history, possible history of the system. So here I have to say that there's a, a pirouette in French. There's no good term to say that in English. There's a technical way to define change in a, in a basic ontology where there's no change at all. So change is the absence of non-change. So change is the absence of changelessness. And what is changelessness? The invariance of history under the time translation of a group under space-time, blah, blah, blah. So 
there, when you take an history, it's not a succession of states. So you don't have a natural notion of time, of change. But you can say certain history have this property when we do some translation, group, blah, 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 transformation, that allow us to think that these are describing change and other not. Okay. It's not important for the rest of my discussion, but it's just if you worry about the fact that there's no change in my basic ontology of Lagrangian mechanic, you're right. And it's why Lagrangian mechanic resists to the problem of time, because there's no time outside this necessary. There's not a general clock for all these changes. OK, so the atoms of possibility in Lagrangian mechanics is histories, and histories are not succession of states and that's by time. OK, come back to kinematical possibilities. So I pause, I propose that there's such a set. But what could it be? How do I define the set of kinematical histories? And there's not much literature about that. In fact, even Butterfield does not discuss that in, in details. And Butterfield 2003 is the only paper I found on modality possibilities in physics. Serious paper, philosophical paper. There's, there's maybe others, but I didn't find any. But if you look at the way it's defined, so of course, dynamical symmetry possibilities are a subset of the kinematical. But when you look, it's the dynamical we're interested in, because we want to know what happened in the actual world. You see that the kinematical that are first, because they, the dynamical are a subset, but in fact, since we aim for the dynamical, the natural way to understand the kinematical is that what would have happened to the system under different laws. So the kinematical possibilities, according to my interpretation of the Lagrangian natural, that I find natural, of the Lagrangian mechanics, is necessarily homological. So there is no possibility in the kinematical of something that is not, there is no laws out. There is no necessity in any modality of any kind of a certain, of a certain set. OK. So. It's the set of histories generated if the system could be governed by different laws. So it's a very structured set, much more structured than the metaphysical possibilities. But of course it's more structured. It's, it's, it has been defined for other use, for use to do, discuss dynamics and solve physical problems. So it's normal. It's, it's much more structured. But it's not just a little bit. It's en enormously more structured than metaphysical. So the, the, according to this formalism, the space of possibilities is much more structured than the general space of metaphysical possibilities. OK. How do we know which, which kinematical histories are are uh, dynamical histories. So how do, how do we work this variational principle I was talking about a few slides ago? So this is the Hamilton principle. This is the way it's done. So you say that the action, the action is, yeah. <laughs> the action is a functional of histories. So for each history, it gives you a number. So for each possible history, it gives you a number. All the laws are, all the dynamics is coded in L, in the function L. So it's a functional of histories. So for each history, it gives you a number. And the idea is that the actual world, the dynamical, is an extremum of this function, the action function. So it's a minimum or a, ma a minimum or a maximum local. So among all the histories, I have this function called the action that gives that gives me a number for each histories and the one that is physical are the external of these this function. Okay, to remark there could be one more than one extrema in the space of possibilities because the extrema is defined locally. It's locally a maximum or minimum, really a minimum. 
So the status of actual, what is actuality, is not that clear, is that from us? Because there could be, at least in principle, more than one actual situation for identical laws, identical situation. Second remark, you see now that the kinematical possibility is even more structured than we thought because it's defined in a way that you can define this function, this number on each possibilities, and this number, and that's, that's explained in the, in the Butterfield paper, could be built as a, as a, as a metric. So you could, be, you could have a metric between histories, histories with close action, are closer in the space of possibilities than history with big difference of action. So you're not, you're not in your typical semantic of possible worlds here. Maybe you could accommodate the semantic of possible world, but, but it's not obvious because you have a natural metric, a continuous metric. OK. Now, a worry of philosopher, not a worry for scientists, a worry of philosopher. I explain the kind of possibilities, blah, blah, blah. A worry of philosopher. Is the actual history, the extremum, because of the Hamilton principle, dependent of possible numerical possibilities? And you have, you have here a mathematical expression that says, if you have a, a local extremum of that, it's when you have a local extremum of that, and this depends possibly on other histories than the one that is selected. So is there, is there here a necessity to commit, to say that this formalism is committing to possible histories beyond the dynamical one, beyond the actual You could also frame that in terms of truth maker. Is the truth makers of this sentence beyond the actual world? If it was the case, it would be extremely weird. Okay, because usually in uh, in classical model language, we're discussing about the model property of the actual world. We refer to possible world as tools to understand the model property of the actual world. We don't commit to the existence of these possible worlds to explain the actual world. We, we can commit to the possible world for other reasons, like Lewis, but not because you need absolutely to use them to model the truth maker of sentence, scientific sentence, in the actual world. Alors, this is a real worry, and I, I say uh, that, uh, that no. <laughs> There's a way to get, to get around, and it's well explained. It's a strategy that Lewis developed for another problem that Butterfield used for this one, and I think it works, so I will just resume this thing, is that you know the minimum here, you have to find the minimum S to have the actual world, the actual, what happened. And you can say that the possible world that you need to, the possible histories that you need to compare, are in fact very close possibilities. So in fact, you're just discussing a variation of your world, little variation, not too far from this world. So these, the truth maker here that seems to require to discuss possibilities that will never happen, could be a reinterpret, and that's the, the Lewis strategy as just discussing variations of our world, so model properties of our world, of our, the actual. And there's nothing in this equation that forces you to go beyond, because each history, each action, only necessitates the properties of that history, and there's nowhere you discuss a real relation between a, re a thick re um, ontological relation between possibilities. You just compare possibilities. This one has a bigger action than this one. You never have a thick relation that would force you to, to discuss the status of each palata. So you have only intrinsic, uh, only a 
relation that refer to intrinsic properties of each possible TSO, no danger, no possibility of truth maker difficulties. Okay. So for the non-philosopher of physics, and even for philosopher of physics, it's a very condensed, it's called a condensed notation. Uh, so here you have an amplitude of transition. So here you have something that says that that will be, if you do the square of that, you get the probability that with a certain state, you will get another state, a state in, a state out. So this is a, a model property of the actual world. See? After that, the, some interpretation of quantum mechanics interpret the probability in a sense or another sense, but that put aside, but at least everybody's talking about you know, the probability here. How do you compute this probability? You do a summation, an integral, on the possible classical histories of this function of the action. So to get and then a uh, probability, a quantum probability in our world, you need this formalism to do a summation of a functional on possible classical histories. Okay? So you have to use the k possibilities of classical mechanics to calculate something about the quantum world. And this function, this, this, this is not a function, this, this element of the equation is the volume density of history. So your history is even more structured because you need, there could be more or less dense histories depend in the space of possible histories. And you have to know how dense it is to do this calculation. So you, you see that even before interpreted that semantically, okay, that's the goal to talk about possibilities and possible world, is to interpret this equation semantically. This does not look good for standard model thought, because here you have something like a density of histories. It will, I don't know how to get rid of the relation between histories if you have explicitly a density at play in the, in the equation. Second, it's quite strange that here you have quantum information, and here you require k possibilities, which are classical, which are false, according to most people defending quantum mechanics. The world is not classical. How to interpret these possibilities semantically. So I see two questions, and I will just catch the way to answer them and I'll be able to answer them. I see two, two big uh, philosophical questions. First one, how do we interpret this dependence? This is, you know, syntactic stuff, where you have actual here, classical possible here. Ah, but in which you know, semantic of modality, this makes sense. Second, before we have just comparison, we just have comparison possibilities. Here we have a sum of phase. So some possibilities we constructively interact, other we destructively interact. What is the status of a sum of possibilities? Uh, I could say, what is the status of the sum of possibilities of this six-phase dice? Well, I just add them. I don't know. There's no meaning interesting. Here, it's quite important. You need the sum to get the possibility. Think about the actual one. What is the, the status of the sum here? So first question. Three strategies. First, you explain that, in fact, there is no problem. 
It looks like a problem, but we have good reason to say it's not. Exactly what I did with classical physics before. It looks bad, but it's not bad. First strategy. Second strategy, get rid of the, the, the kinematical. Find a way to say it's, you know, it's redundant, it should not be there. Third, invoke pragmatic considerations. Yeah, it looks bad, but for cognitive, you know, social, blah, blah, blah reason, we cannot do otherwise. Three different strategies that are not, are not uh, necessarily exclusive, but uh, to make sense of the first question. So let's see. Uh, maybe it's not a real problem, because in fact, these classical possibilities used in this formalism are not really classical possibilities. They are some kind of quantum possibilities written in another way. You know, yeah, in a certain sense, a classical possibilities is a quasi-limit of quantum stuff, which would need to be very discussed in details. To I'm not sure it works, but something like that. And maybe if we adopt the consistent history's interpretation of quantum mechanics, where you don't have classical histories, but you have decoherent uh, uh, histories, so almost classical histories, almost in the mind of physicists, of course, not in the mind of philosophers. So that would be a strategy to say there's no problem. Second strategy to say there's no problem. OK, classical possibilities are false and impossible because we know that the world is quantum or something like quantum. So they are impossible in our world. So let's use, you know, Berto's impossible worlds for Malazan. I have no idea how to do that, but why not? Let's try. Impossibilities generating stuff about the actual world will be typical of that kind of metaphysician. Metaphysicist or metaphysician? Metaphysician. Metaphysician. Okay. Medicine, that's fine. It's been a long time I talk in English, you know, one year at home. <laughs> okay, so this, I'm just putting that there. I have no idea how to do it, but I know that some people said to me, maybe you should try that. Why not? Okay, so that was the first strategy. You see that? Not easy, not easy. I don't know how to do it in details, just except waving my hand saying, yeah, there's some kind of... Second strategy, get rid of the kinematical possibilities. Nobody, to my knowledge, know how to do that. It seems that we always need something of classical physics when we built a quantum theory. So maybe it's not necessary a proof, maybe it's not necessary, but we don't know how to get rid of it. So this strategy for now is not. Third strategy. And I, I used one of these strategies in my in another paper, another subject. Yeah, you know, we have cognitive difficulties to understand quantum mechanics. So when we formulate quantum mechanics to equation, we need to rely on classical physics for all cognitive mathematical formalism. We're just on it's it's just a good trick. Or, since we do not have a consensual solution to the measurement problem, so we don't really know how classical and quantum connect quantum physics and classical behavior, empirical behavior connect in the real world, we don't really know how to get rid of it, and it's because there's another deeper problem in quantum mechanics that we have to solve first. So as you can see, I'm not that impressed by these possibilities, but they seem plausible. Someone could try to, to do Second question, and I will... That will be the last part. What about the sum? What about the sum? What is the status of the sum here? The sum over classical possibilities to get to quantum stuff. And I thought about that for a long time until I discovered that I had a solution in another paper that I, that I wrote not a long time ago and I forgot that it was a solution to this problem. So in a paper with, uh, published in 2018 with uh, Vincent Dorel, we developed a, not, a new a theory of quantum causality. And we had an interpretation of the sum puzzle. 
So in fact, it's an interpretation, a semantic interpretation of this syntax of the server. And I will just give you a flavor because it's quite technical. Maybe Kevin will discuss that because he read the paper yesterday or today. Uh, but uh, I will just give you a flavor of this theory and you will see how it connects to possibilities and sum of possibilities. Give a semantic interpretation of the sum of possibilities. So here, imagine classical process. They are classical. So there's the process one, you give him a zero, give it the zero, it gives you a zero. Process two, you give it a zero. Let's imagine they are deterministic process. Okay? So they can be understood as causal process in the DAO, you know, classical process rule conception of causality. And you have here, you know, these same input, these two process do something. I have a process of interaction, some kind of interaction that makes the process, and I have a result. So you see here, everything is actual. It's just two classical process interacting. It's a typical causal interaction. Okay? Okay. Now, imagine that you have the same process, but this process could sometimes be zero or one. Okay? So alone, this process is a classical process giving sometimes zero, stochastic, or sometimes one. Okay? But you say these two histories, the one in which the process gives zero and the one, they in fact interact causally in the quantum world. So these two classical stochastic histories combine in the quantum process. Like they were happening at the same time, but they are not happening. They are possible stories that interact in a certain way. And that's what this quantum process rule goes out. So we can generalize that, do a lot of math and Lagrangian for it to work. But it's the basic idea is that possible classical history, so possible classical process, a quantum process is a combination of classical incompatible histories, like they were happening at the same time. But of course, they don't. I'm not realist about that. It's a black box. It's just a way to represent the difference between classical process and quantum process. So one of the conclusions of the paper are, in our account of causation, a quantum causal process is a modal functional addition of classical causal process. In consequence, quantum causation is radically different from classical causation. However, there's a strong continuity between classical and quantum causation. For example, possible histories that are close to the actual classical one contribute more to the quantum process than the one that are far. So there's a relation between the two, to the transition amplitude. And that's a way to interpret causally this, this sum. But of course, there must be other semantic interpretation around that I didn't find. So, so conclusion. I was pretty short, that's cool. This short exploration shows that when you start from practice, you can get to very strange stuff that will be difficult to fit in the very elegant model of metaphysician. I'm not saying that the model of metaphysician is wrong. It's not a falsification. But it, at least it gives you an, a, an incitation to go deeper in you know, what, what are the possibilities used to maybe enrich the metaphysical, the metaphysics, pure metaphysics for medicine. But of course, we cannot just say we, they are doing that and that, because maybe it's inquiry. So at one point, we will have to connect with truth makers, semantics, semantic of possible, a formal tool developed by metaphysician and logician, logician or logicist, logician, to, to come back to physics and give a good semantic interpretation in a nice formalism that guaranteed coherence and not obscure, not to be obscure. So, so here I see that the, the notion of uh, Lagrangian possibilities that they are used in, in, uh, in, uh, in physics, in classical physics, and used also in, in quantum physics, it's much more structured and much more uh, yeah, yeah, structured than metaphysical possibilities. And that this kind of, of uh, structure at least 
give us a certain flavor or possibilities that we can maybe define natural possibilities not just as what is selected by laws, but something, something richer, something more interesting. And how to represent this richness in a nice, you know, modal formalism for me is, uh, I don't know, I, I tried then, but I didn't find a good way. I think possible worlds are not perfect for classical physics, but I still, they seem to do the job, but clearly they are completely useless for mechanics because there's some kind, some kind of density and some stuff that would make possible it's a little bit difficult to understand. Thank you. And here are our the comment of Kevin. Should we turn that? Thank you for the Or maybe you should. Oh, no, yeah, you should. You should move. That yeah, that's, that's, that's the easiest way. Yeah. Can you just start? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you for this talk, uh, Alexandre. Um, I want to start with a uh, few general comments. Uh, a couple of things that I think is really nice in your talk. Uh, one is the fact that uh, you're talking about Lagrangian, you talk about uh, histories, not trajectories. So it's very nice to have this uh, generalization of general uh, coordinates. And we are not just talking about movement, we are talking about change. Your mask off. Okay. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm a road to? Wow. I don't know what's a road to. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I think this uh, emphasis on histories in the dynamics rather than trajectory is a really nice thing uh, because of this uh, ext extension to uh, quantum stuff. Uh, in quantum stuff, when you do Feynman diagrams, a lot of people are, tend to um, have this um, wrong interpretation of Feynman diagrams as trajectories of particles, which is uh, not true. And it's nice that. Uh, we insist on histories of our trajectories. Another nice thing with that is that uh, movement doesn't have a, movement is not like a specific stuff. It's just one of the change. And I think metaphysically, it's a nice way to see stuff rather than just saying that movement is a specific stuff that uh, physics should uh, put in on a special uh, place. Um, another thing is uh, with this uh, quantum uh, and classical relation that you showed is. Uh, it uh, links back to a problem that we had uh, that was in the start of quantum mechanics with Bohr's uh, uh, principle of necessity of, uh, of um, classical uh, conceptions to use to describe metaphysics because uh, quantum physics because uh, as uh, Bohr said at the time when you are doing uh, experiment you are doing everything classically and so to link to uh, the quantum stuff you are forced to think uh, classically so. You have here, I think, another instance of this kind of uh, issues when you talk about quantum stuff. What are you talking about? Because when every intuition we have, every thinking we have is about classical stuff. So here we have another kind of this um, issue with uh, how to understand quantum mechanics. Um, after a while, uh, I have a few other comments that I'm not so sure about. Because um, you, you were saying that you try, want to do this uh, stuff to avoid having the selecting by laws, uh, possibility selected by laws. But uh, when you're talking about theoretical uh, possibility in physics, my understanding of it is uh, it's the possibilities that are selected by the equations of your system that your system follows. So in that way, how is it different from selecting by laws? I'm not so sure about that. So if you can comment on that. Do uh, you want me to uh, comment now? Uh, I, well, I can say another thing, but uh, another thing that I don't know. I can wait at the end. Or okay, okay. okay. No, no. Sir, sir, it's really as you wish. Okay, no, well, I can have uh, other questions. I could just specific questions that if you want to. I can follow, okay. Uh, another thing, yeah, another thing I had uh, quite a question with is uh, with this possibility of having. Um, uh, uh, the, the fact that you're talking about uh, having more than one experiment for the histories, uh, because you say it's because of the locality of it, but there is another possibility uh, with uh, linked points. If, if you have uh, linked uh, points, you can have different uh, trajectories, and you can't select just uh, a priori on which history is the actual one, because you have a continuum and with all the external factions, which are all external factions. Um, and after what would be a more, uh, general, more precise question on the uh, extension to your talk, so if you want to install no on that. Okay. Should I go back? No, no. Okay. Thank you for this 
already too good question. So I, I use the word I use the word the word um, variation. A kinematical history is what blah blah blah. Uh, the history could be if there were other laws. Of course, I use the word laws to make to be to be comprehensible. But it's true that it's it's a bad word because laws means something else in metaphysics of science. So means could be could be disposition, could be and no. I should have been chosen by the dynamics. And a kind of dynamics in physics is a not say primitive object, but is considered a primitive object in the way people talk. And after that people like us, metaphysicians, try to understand could we understand what is a dynamic through a concept of laws. Okay? But you're right that I was claiming that I was bottom up, starting from possibility to get to a different thing. But at the end, I I, I, I was saying that in fact, they, in fact, these kinematical possibilities depend on what dynamics, possible dynamics. So someone could say, in other words, laws. Yes. So so that was not the goal, <laughs> but it's the conclusion. On the other hand, I still think it's a bottom-up approach because it starts from the practice and not from the metaphysics. So it's not bottom-up starting from possibility to get to laws, like I announced, but still it's starting from the practice. But you're right that I should have been, maybe I should not use the word laws. It's only later in the project when we try to interpret what is this selecting dynamics or this structuring dynamics. And could it be explained by a theory of laws, like Armstrong, like, uh, like uh, Lewis, etc.? Sorry, that you're absolutely right. What was the second one? It was on the fact that you would have uh, linked the points. Yes, you're absolutely right that certain cases of multiple extremum are not problematic. They could be the produce of a um, surplus of structure in the, the formalism. They could be in the way we built the. Uh, we build the coordinate system. There could be all kind of examples that are just non-problematic. They are, but still, there's the possibility that we can meet problematic one. It's not forbidden in the formalism, to my knowledge, in the Lagrangian formalism, that there could be more than one genuine extrema uh, that we would have to discuss. To, but you're right that many cases of multiple extremums are easily um, dissolved. Yes. Yeah. So if I can follow some of this, so okay, if I can follow that, um, so we have these cases with uh, where the set of dynamical possibilities are not just a single element, and you have uh, several of them, like uh, if you have a gauge invariant or something. So um, in terms of this model, uh, uh, interpretation of it, how do you uh, interpret picking a gauge to resolve your system? But something that you do in practical physics. Okay, and that that that's just a nasty question because you know, you, no, 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 it's not nasty. You know, you know that it's a technical question that I could not answer because it will depend of how you interpret gauge, 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 gauge uh, degrees of freedom. Uh, I would say for pedagogical reason that many of our best actual theories are what we call gauge theories. So they have this symmetry that makes that that says that there's too too many solutions for for the real world. And so there's this indeterminism in the solution and you have many solutions and you have to to select one to, to get to the to the prediction. And I have to say that this is not rare. All the best theories that we have, standard model, general relativity, all have this flaws, should we say flaws for now. But depending on your interpretation, what is, what is at play, I think it could be a problem or not. So if you see, you say that it's a, a surplus of structure, that the standard interpretation, okay, it's a technical problem to get rid of it. Okay, it's a technical problem how to get to the, to the, to the real histories, the real mathematical objects, and dependent of the coordinates. Because this is why I like Lagrangian mechanics. It's because it's a, it's a, the history is it's an object. It's a pure mathematical object that could be described in many ways with many coordinate systems. 
But if gauge, gauge symmetries is the sign of something else, like relational, strong relational properties, especially among space-time points or things like that, I think you don't have to choose or you have a natural gauge to choose. So you have good reason to choose one and you get to, to, to the right kinematical possibilities. Or you have a very messy kinematical set where, yeah. It's not the case, but there's a lot of physical, like when you're under learning physics, there is a lot of cases when you exercise and you're, you're just asked to pick a gauge and you have like some conventional, conventional gauge, but they are not necessary. So there's yeah, a natural way. But let, let me explain why you're in a mess, okay? Because the notion of histories will be well defined, even if it's weird. Yeah. Because it's history, that's it. But the problem is the Lagrangian. The Lagrangian function to get to the action, how do you calculate the action of something that is in very complicated and non-local variables? So there, there will be a real problem, possible problem. And there's all kind of trick to get rid of them, to, to cut this symmetry or to find a way to get it under control. But it's not in the basic notion of history, because a history is a history. Whatever it is, whatever it describes, it's a history. You know, that's it. Whatever you call a history in your, in your physics, it, it's not. But when you want to do the Hamilton principle, and you want to, to do some, some work on that, and you want to have a derivation and things like that, uh, if, the, if the variables is a mess, very difficult to define a variation. Because I didn't say that, but here, Here, it's a very compact way to say that there's a derivative of the, sh of the, of the different fields at play to the, 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 in the index mu. So it's a derivative here. So you could have difficulties to define a, a Lagrangian in a, in, a, in a correct way. So the Hamilton principle will maybe not work. But these are over my pay grade, but I can see how they could be a problem. So uh, you I think we discussed this morning, so with uh, this question of how to define the Lagrangian, because there is, uh, in the practice of physics, there is another thing that we do is uh, using the Torch theorem, saying that we have principles that we want to, uh, to apply to our physics systems so that they can be realistic, like energy conservation, for example. And this implies something for Lagrangian, so it's constrained the Lagrangian in a way, it should, it should constrain the possibilities we have of uh, kinetical and mechanical possibilities we have, right? So, mm -hmm. as uh, what you discussed this morning, so maybe if you want to... Uh, yeah, so just, just to explain to, to, the, to the public, if you have other constraints, like you say, energy must be conserved for all kind of reason. Of course, kinematical stories that we not, do not conserve energy would be excluded. And how do you exclude it? Because they are not necessarily in the simple dynamics that I'm using, or maybe I don't know that my dynamics is conserving energy or not. So there's a theorem, there's two and a half theorem of Newton. So one of them is to say that for a vast class of system, and I won't define it here because it's technical, for a vast class of systems, if you have a conservation principle, if and only if you have some kind of invariance in the Lagrangian. And it's a if and only if. So it goes both ways. But like I said to, to you this morning, it de it's not because it mathematically bo go both ways that it philosophically or metaphysically goes both ways. The standard interpretation of Lagrange, for example, is that the dynamic is first, the conservation principle is a derivative. So he, he would say that, okay, there's a if and only if. He would not say because Nedutar Theorem was published after his death, but he would say there's a if and only if mathematically, and I agree with that, but conceptually, or this ground that, and not the reverse. <coughs> and like I said, for Lange, also it's symmetry that ground conservation principle because invariant symmetry are meta laws, are potentially meta laws, and they constrain dynamics. So it's Kind of there. Okay, it's going up here, going down here, and coming to the conservation principle. But of course, these all can, all can be discussed 
semantically, uh, what is the commitment? Because mathematically, these are, most of it, objection, <coughs> if and only if. And I would agree, one of the difficulties that I had when I began to, dis to think about physical possibilities is what are the constraints of physical possibilities beyond, beyond you know, dynamics? Is there a meta principle like continuity of movement? It's implicit here in the kinematical <laughs> that all histories do not are, are, are continuous. Is it in time? Is it in space? Not that clear, but they are continuous in a certain set. This is not where it's coming from, this commitment. Is there other bizarre commitments like that, like energy conservation or whatever others that would be not just <coughs> empirical derivation of the dynamics, but meta principle in a very strong metaphysical sense. And I don't know what they are, because this continuity is the only one I found that seems always every classical history is continuous in a certain sense. Not always in the same one. It could be fields, it could be particles, it could be machines. They are continuous in a certain sense, but not in all sense. Conservation of energy, you can imagine possible physical, classical world where energy is not conserved in certain interaction. It does not seem to be a, some, a strong, strong constraint, even if in practice, in the practice of physics, it's a very strong constraint. But the continuity for classical physics, I don't know how to get rid of it. Determinism, you can get rid of it, even in classical physics. There's, there's possible worlds where classical physics is not deterministic, but yeah, it's a good point. <laughs>